I teach political philosophy at Dartmouth College, and um, any student of political philosophy reads thinkers such as Machiavelli and learns that powerful people, people who want power, will do ruthless things. They will certainly, and most certainly, lie if they need to, to advance their ends. Lying is a, an ineliminable part of politics. It's everywhere in the political world, not just because power seekers are ruthless, but also because liars, like political people, want to be free. They want to reshape the way things are and resist the recalcitrance, the stubbornness of the world as it is, and remake it according to their wishes and desires. And that's what political people want, too. So political people are deep, have a deep affiliation with mendacity, with lying. And that goes back as far as politics goes. Nonetheless, there's a widespread sensibility in the United States today that we are up against something new, not just the customary affiliation of politics and lies, but something different. And just Sunday, David Lennart and Stuart Thompson in the New York Times compiled the definitive list of president of the lies that they say President Trump has uttered merely since he's been inaugurated, beginning with statements like, the reason I lost the popular vote is because between three and five million people voted illegally. And they isolate each lie and stack them up one by one, like bricks in a wall that eventually separates us from reality, such that we're disoriented and don't quite know what's true and what's false anymore. Indeed, they say, every president has shaded the truth or told some occasional whoppers, but no other president of either party has behaved as Trump is behaving. He is trying to create an atmosphere in which reality is irrelevant. Today's deep, deep dive is meant to help orient us as citizens in this moment when, when some fear that our relationship to reality is being altered and when the place of lying in politics is taking a new direction. So first, to help us understand our own relationship to truth and, and falsity, we have Fred Dust from IDEO, um, and, and he is going to lead us in an exercise that's meant to illuminate for ourselves our own, something of our own relationship to truth. Fred, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I'm also here to make sure that you're all awake after lunch. So um, that's a piece of it. So this is going to be a very interactive, very short. So at least if it's interactive and it's awkward, it's very short. Just know that piece. So it's actually good. But exactly right. We want to hear from you guys today a little bit about what does it mean to think of to have truths as our as individuals, and how much commonality do we actually see in the truths we have? So we're going to do a quick exercise called Truth and Lies, where I'm going to be asking you guys questions about what we believe is true and why so. To help you with this, con with this conversation, there's a paddle. Everybody grab their paddles. Um, these are really fun. Um, so basically, when I ask you to, I'm going to ask you to answer a question, truth or lies, and if you agree with the truth, um, you're going to hold it up like this. Okay, good, y'all good. Um, if you disagree, you're going to hold it up like this. And you all get to take this home and use it with your spouse afterwards. So it's great. It's like, I promise you, in our household, it makes everything work. So it's like, it's like you can use it in all kinds of different things. So, um, but it's, it's going to be fun. I am going to ask people to kind of volunteer a little bit. So get ready. If, if, no, if anyone volunteers, I'm going to call on you. So we're going to go from there. Um, so here's the premise of what I want to talk about, and then we're going to go, we're going to go into like a few examples. Um, so I'm going to throw out some truths, and I'm going to ask you, first of all, um, 
the first question is, what do you know is true? Do you believe this is true? So I'll throw out a truth, and I'm going to have you basically look at the screen, don't look at each other, and put up your paddle one way or another and tell me, yes, I agree or I don't agree. The next question I'm going to ask is, what kind of evidence? Do you have evidence for this piece of truth? Um, and I'm going to call on you around the room to basically be like, yeah, I think I can prove this. Let me, let me get something. But the, in the end, I don't actually care if we prove it or not. That's not the goal. What I really want to discover is, um, so what would it mean to you if, despite all the evidence you have, if it wasn't true? How would you feel? And that's the question that I'm going to be asking you kind of in the, in the latter part of this. So does it feel pretty straightforward? We're all ready for it. We all have hands on our paddles, so it's like we're, we're there. Good. So I'm going to throw out the first question um, and the, fir the first truth um, and see how you guys respond to it. So, and I'm not going to, I'm not, I won't vote. Ready? The Earth is roundish. So forget if you don't believe it's ovoid or whatever. OK, so you didn't look at each other. Everybody look at each other. Um, pretty much everyone. There are no flat earthers in this room that I can see. <laughs> Any flat, no, no one? OK, no. All right, so the, there are no flat earthers in this room. So that's, you guys kind of fundamentally believe that's a truth. That's great. So let's go to that next question that I had, which is, Bring the paddles back up, because I know you all believe this one. So who has evidence? What, what are the things that people believe that they actually are holding true that they can actually say actually makes them feel like there's truth? Anyone want to give a, and it, it doesn't have to be scientific, just like, what, what makes you believe this is true? You, you've got something here, Max? Uh, the truism is in the fact that as you look out against the earth, it, you lose its resistance. Great. So, so Max basically said, it's like there's two things. He gave two, two examples, which are great examples. One is that we learned it, so there's actually something that feels like it's fact, but also it feels observable to you. So you feel like when, I, when you look out, you can see it over a distance. Anyone else want to add something into that? Yes, Robert. You've traveled around the world. <laughs> you've tra <laughs> you've tra you think you've traveled around the world. OK, awesome. By the way, isn't this kind of like auction paddling? I wish I was selling something right now, because it's like, it's, like, it's like, anyone, who else has evidence or truth? Yes, over here. I can't see your name. A satellite photo. So that's a great example. And I wonder how many of us would have held that in our minds, which is actually there's a very famous first image, right, of like taken from a spacecraft, but also satellite photos that basically tell us, oh, observably, it looks like it's at least round. It might be, you know, round on the other side as well, but we don't know, but it, but it looks like it. So we, we believe we have observable evidence, exactly. Anyone else? Yes? Galileo. Galileo. Great. So here's, the, so here's the thing. So we have learning and education. We have things we've observed ourselves. We actually have kind of outside evidence of observation. It's been studied, and you would say that science is there. So those are, those are things that we actually say we, we actually believe. Now let's go back to the thing that I think is sort of the harder question. So um, what would it mean to you, personally, if this wasn't true? So like, let's say something comes through tomorrow, and it basically says, um, we just figured it out, and it's actually, it turns out it's triangular, and like, you know, it's, you know, it's like, and we're the only thing here. What, how, what would that mean to you? So how does that feel, and, and what does that do to your worldview? So it's a harder question, but I really want somebody to kind of offer up it. Right here. There you go. So, so it has huge business implications for, um, for the cruise ships and whatever, because you're like, how are we going to keep doing this if we don't believe in this fundamentally? Yes? It says that there's It would, so, uh, can you, uh, so uh, say it one more time a little louder, sorry. It, says that there's science. it would shake my faith in science. So I think this is a really important one. Like, think about that fundamentally. There's, there's an amazing book that um, I found out because it was on Obama's reading list called The Three-Body Problem that basically talks about what happens when basically physics is disproved and what happens to scientists and how they kind of like have this huge issue around it. So anyone else? Yes. Say the You'd say the opposite. It's, it's a nice and so that's really interesting. So the, basically the, uh, the argument there is like if there's new science that's actually able to kind of be definitively proven, then actually it's kind of giving me more faith in science. So it's an interesting kind of nuance. Anyone else? There's someone way in the back with their hand up. You might have to really yell. Sorry. Well, I feel like if you don't physically, if nothing is physically changed, oh, sorry. <laughs> if, nothing, if nothing is physically changed, I feel like it would be irrelevant that 
it's been found to be untrue that the Earth is round. Okay, so stop for a second. This is really interesting. So it would change my, my faith in science. It would actually make me feel more faithful. And it really wouldn't change that much. Like, it's like, if everything seems like it's kind of working, then I feel okay with it for the moment. So, so that's it. I'm going to tell you, in the world, I'm going to show you three quest three truths. Um, in the world, this was actually meant to be the easiest one. So it's like, after this, it gets a lot more difficult. And I think... Some people think the last one's the hardest. The next one I'm going to show you, I think, is going to be absolutely the hardest one for this room. So, um, so I'm going to go on to our next truth. Are you ready for it? Dogs and cats can love me. I'm going to put love me. So who agrees or disagrees? Dogs and cats can love. Ah, all right. So if you look around the room, most people agree, and there's about, like, seven or eight people who we want to really explore with them, what's wrong with them, um, who basically disagree. So, so, um, so first, let's go put the paddles back up. Who can, what's your evidence that dogs and cats can love? Who wants to actually throw something out? Somebody? Come on. Okay, you, in the back. Okay, so... Okay, so your dog is not simulating emotion for food. It's basically saying, ah, oh, I really love you, I'm back. Okay, so it's like you, you, have, you have direct physical evidence, you believe, of some of, of, of a state. Somebody else, over here. Okay, so even after I feed my dogs, they still want to be with me. So that's, that's pretty nice. That, that would be proof in like a spousal context, certainly. So it's like, um, <laughs> behind you. So basically she was saying that it's like, I've seen evidence. So first of all, there's actually been some study that's kind of seemed to prove that actually dogs and cats are so, so, so um, a connection to other species. So it's actually not, it, it could be any other species actually, if I'm correct. Um, so it's like, I mean, or any other kind of um, a, a creature. So there's multiple things there. It's both the evidence as well as kind of, it goes beyond maybe even humans. Yes. They can feel pain. They can feel pain. So the, that's a great, so the, they, they can feel pain, so they, they, they should be able to feel the opposite. And that's a really great, I think that's an example of, of deep empathy, perhaps, as a way of kind of proving it. So you're saying, well, I feel this, so, and if I can feel this and I also feel this, is there some connection between it, which is an interesting thing. Okay, so, so basically it's like, it's just, you're just saying it's a low, low bar for loving you. Okay, great. So it's like, great. All right, who, so wait, there was like seven people. I just want to see the people who were like, no way. Okay, so over here. I found cats to be completely indifferent to me for my entire life. Dog, dogs are completely different. They're lovable, but cats completely indifferent towards uh, me. Okay, that's so my come observation. On. So there's not, thank you, right? So there's not more debate about whether cats or dogs can love. Like, do some people believe dogs can love and cats can't? I'm just curious. All right, so wait, so in the middle, I know you've got a lot to say in this. I completely agree. And I think it completely depends on how you're defining love. Ah, okay, interesting. So it depends on the definition. So, so back here. So, so I don't think either dogs or cats can love, but I think they can exhibit other tendencies that we would equate with love between human beings, for example. So I think they can have dependence. I think they can have loyalty. I think they can show appreciation. I think they can show disappointment if they don't expect and uh, if they don't receive an expected outcome. And for me, that doesn't add up to love, although many of those things can sometimes be characteristics of love. That's, that's really interesting. So I really want to call on that answer because I think all these answers have been great examples. But I think this is one of the things we're most interested in exploring this, this year while we're at the festival is um, how are we defining the terms that are put in our place? And what you did very well, I think, is you defined. You said, I don't think it's, it's it, it could be something like love, but it's not our definition of love, or it's a different definition of love. And that's one of the things that I think we have to really kind of be careful around as we're thinking about truth and lies, is that how often are we bringing our definition to the table? Um, and how often have we spoken through what that definition is? I'm going to go to the hard one. Um, for the people who basically were like, my dog loves me, my cat loves me, what would it mean to you if it wasn't true? Let's go back. Let's see the paddles again. There's someone way in the back who has a very... 
Um, as a really big animal lover, I think it's kind of like a lost sense of companionship if it's just, it's like a false sense that you build because for a lot of people, like your your pets become like part of your family and if it's, it feels like that emotion's reciprocated and what if it's like a lie and just kind of like our man-made concept, then it's kind of like, well, what was I believing in? Hmm. So there's two things there, which is both like, you feel a little more alone in the world maybe, and also it's actually shaking your faith. So going back to the earlier things we were talking about, like you actually believed it, so what happens when it goes away? Who else? There, sir. Emotions coming from my animal, even if I anthropomorphize the emotions coming from my animals, it doesn't change the fact that I love them. Interesting. So actually, it, it might not change your perspective at all. So the reality is that actually, like, even if it's like you, you still love them, and that's what matters in this case. Yeah, I don't think necessarily I love them because I perceive them only because I perceive them loving me back. That's interesting. So, okay, so by the way, so the, question, the, the response here is it might call into question what human love is. So let's go back to the first question that I asked, which is about flat earth. And if you remember, it was like, it might call into question science. It might actually call into question, make actually previously like a firm science, or it might not matter at all. And you just basically try and get the same exact thing. So I don't care because I still love it, like that, the dog or cat. I actually, I, now it calls into question my faith, and you're basically saying, it actually calls into question the faith, the, the notions I have about humanity, or what it means to be alive, right? Okay, so interesting things. So I'm gonna do one last one, and um, arguably, this should be, uh, I'm curious to see what this plays out. Um, and this is, a, this is the, yeah, but here we go. Climate change is man-made. Not as fun, right, um, as the other two. So, <laughs> so let's, let's, let's see the paddles. I'm seeing a correlation between people who think dogs can love and climate change, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you what that is, actually. <laughs> so it's like, all right. Um, so who has, who has some evidence that they wanna throw out? Sir. Uh huh. Anthropogenic activities affect climate, but so do many other things. Uh huh. So there's lots of evidence of significant climate change not involving human activity. In fact, that may be the most important source of climate change. We may be headed for another ice age, but it may come a little late. Great. Because we have tipped the balance in the short term in a way that is likely to be very disruptive to us and the rest of nature as we know. Interesting. So that's a, that's a, it's a great thing, and I, I think it's a really interesting thing to think about as you think about truths, which is that your, your point is that it may or may not be the most important factor, but it's a factor that actually has kind of has, has contributed. And the reality also is that um, we, um, it doesn't matter because it's still moving forward. So you're kind of like, you're recontextualizing it. Can I get somebody else on this? Yes. Climate change goes across the eons. So it's, it's a persistent question. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this is a, it's a great point, and I think it goes back to the, and I, I know I have to wrap up here, it goes back to defining our terms, right? Which is you're sort of saying, it's a simplistic question, um, but often truths or lies are often simplistic. We actually keep them at that level for reasons. Um, so we're actually not having to draw the, the, the things back around that. So I'm gonna leave you with this. I'm not gonna ask you what would it mean if, um, if emotionally this wasn't true, but I do wanna talk about this for a moment as you go forward. I think the critical thing here that we wanna talk about, and one of the things we're most interested in the festival, is making sure sure that we understand how we're defining our terms as we're talking about things. And I think that's as true with truth and lies and the things we might call truth and lies as anything else. Like you must stop for a moment and basically say, why, stop it, but not saying like what proves it, but what, what do I have at stake if it's not true? And what's that making me kind of think about? So as we go into this conversation this afternoon, think about that. You have things at stake. What does that mean when we think about truth and lies? How the law, in particular the First Amendment, um, relates to truth and, and, and lies. Does our law protect lies? Was it meant to protect a, a culture of lying or a politics of lying? Or, or, or is, it, uh, is it really motivated by a desire to protect the truth? Um, 
And, and so let me, let me turn first to, to you, Jack, and, and ask you about um, the founders. Um, how did they understand what, say, the First Amendment was meant to do? Um, was it meant to make the political world safe for, for, for lying? Um, so uh, the kind of depth I'm, uh, I'm supposed to provide is the depth of historical context. My own view is if you don't have historical context, you, you, can, you can never properly understand uh, any issue in our, in our own time. So I think the starting point to you know, this answer, Russ, is to say that there was a dominant idea about freedom of speech and freedom of press in 17th and 18th century Anglo-American law. And uh, the dominant idea is that uh, while there was no prior restraint on what presses could publish, and in theory on what people could say uh, in any public forum, there was a well-defined tradition that said that if you uh, engage in speech acts that were seditious, that were destructive of or inimical to the authority of government, you would be legally liable. So it's the doctrine we know is uh, a seditious libel. Um, truth has no place in this doctrine. Uh, the key harm being done is that a, a statement you may make is going to be so derogatory, so inimical to the authority of government, it's going to impose some kind of net harm on uh, social well-being and, and, and political stability. So what you say in, in criticism of the king and his ministers, or let's say a a royal governor, it might be perfectly true, but if it's really destructive of the authority of government, uh, then, then it should become subject to, subject to prosecution. Uh, that, that argument comes under a lot of strain uh, in the American Revolutionary Era, and by the time we get to the early 19th century, it's effectively been undermined. Uh, and so, so the question arises, what's the nature of the strain that's imposed on the dominant idea? that says seditious libel is bad. I don't care what, what, whether what you say is true or not. The net harm is there, and there, therefore we have to prosecute it. And the story I want to tell um, you know, on the historical depth side actually says there are two parts of the First Amendment that we have to pay particular attention to. First Amendment begins with the religion clauses. Congress will make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and then it proceeds to the freedom of speech, freedom of press clauses, and then on to our right to assemble and, and peaceful petition. There is a kind of hierarchy there, and I want to suggest historically that religion really mattered in a way that's hard for us now to understand, which I think would play into Kitty's, uh, Kitty's theme about morality. The argument goes something like this. Under the pressure raised by, you know, in, in the aftermath of the early 16th century Reformation, you know, taking place 500 years ago, uh, you know, or, you know, within, you know, within two years, the dominant understanding that's espoused by people like John Locke at the end of the 17th century and certainly by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison at the end of the 18th century is that religious belief is essentially a matter of opinion. Uh, of course, there are the great truths of Christianity you're expected to subscribe to, but the idea of what, what, what exactly do you believe about the structure of a church or the, the proper mode of salvation, how you, think about, uh, the, uh, how you think about the sacraments, how you think about baptism, all of these in the end are matters of opinion, and we want to protect the individual's right. And when I say individual, I mean men and women. He created them both. We want to protect an individual right to make up one's mind uh, on that opinion. And by the eve of the American Revolution, uh, the American colonists did not set out as being heartfelt devotees of theories of religious liberty. They wanted for themselves, but not the groups that they disagreed with. But by the middle of the 18th century, I think on the eve of the Revolution, after the, you know, the, the great religious revival we, we call the First Great Awakening, I think this acceptance of a kind of sovereign autonomy on the part of individuals to decide what they believed, uh, it was coming to be broadly recognized. The problem with this is uh, opinion is not a matter of truth. Opinion says, I have some final right of judgment based on my individual reading of the Bible. You know, you can argue it out with your neighbors and, you know, within your church. But it's essentially, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's, a lower, it, it's a lower threshold for determining what's really true and what's not. So we're going to recognize your moral autonomy as an individual. What happens after that, and I'll round on my story pretty quickly, is I think a set of uh, beliefs about the importance of opinion that actually originates not in the realm of politics, where it's too dangerous, but in the realm of religion, starts to move into the political sphere. That happens with the American Revolution, and it's reinforced by the great political disputes of the 1790s, you know, which have Jefferson and Madison on one side, and Hamilton and Washington and John Adams uh, on the other side, and which culminates in the passing of the famous Sedition Act of 1798, which did allow truth to become a defense. 
so there is you know, some you know, significant wrinkle in legal doctrine. But my key point is that what originates in the realm of religion moves into the realm of politics. So there's a kind of sequencing here, which on the moral side, I think it's important for us to understand. The last point I want to make here is that there is a Jefferson, took a Jefferson-Madison angle here, is that um, they, they uh, aligned themselves being militant opponents of the Sedition Act. Uh, they did believe very much in freedom of speech, freedom of press, and they felt in the kind of the great Jeffersonian calculus that the best way to resolve these issues was to be able to argue them out. Uh, in the realm of religion and in the realm of politics alike, the more open debate we have, the more truth tests will emerge in the process of the debate, and the better off we will be, not just individually, but collectively, to figure out what is politically or religiously true and what isn't. The religious side, Jefferson said, we're all going to become Unitarians. Madison had a somewhat different opinion. That didn't happen, in fact. But that, in a sense, Jefferson's Unitarian prediction represents his own belief about how the whole system would operate. So, so we become, over the course, really, of uh, many decades, a, a, a country where each person has a right to his or her own opinion. But we didn't start out necessarily that way. Um, I, I, um, I can't help but read these tweets. And I, I noticed a tweet by President Trump where he said, it's not freedom of the press when newspapers and, and others are allowed to say and write whatever they want, even if it's completely false. And, and I have to say, I, I, I'll, I'm, I'm um, inclined to agree with him at a common sense level. It, does freedom of the press protect fake news? Does it protect us in, 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 in publishing and voicing our opinions, even if those opinions have no basis in, in fact? Is that what the First Amendment is about? And let me turn to the con scholar of contemporary constitutional law. Jeff, is that freedom of the press? So the Supreme Court first touched on the question of false statements uh, in the very first opinion it ever issued on the meaning of the First Amendment, um, 1917. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, confronting the question, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, well, what does that mean? It sounds like it's absolute. And what Holmes basically said, it can't be absolute. It wouldn't make any sense if it was absolute. And he gave the famous hypothetical uh, of the false cry of fire in a crowded theater. And what makes that hypothetical work is that the cry of fire is false. A true cry of fire is a completely different thing, of course. And so it, it, from the very first, the court understood that false statements of fact are different. And indeed, they don't actually presumptively serve any purposes that the First Amendment itself is designed to further. And therefore, for the next 40 or so years, uh, the basic assumption was that false statements of fact were not protected by the First Amendment. Um, and that came to a head in 1964 in a landmark decision uh, called New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, which involved a libel action brought by a public official uh, against the New York Times uh, for a statement that was factually false about that public official. And the Supreme Court said that consistent with the First Amendment, um, the, the plaintiff, the public official, cannot recover damages, even though this was a false statement of fact, unless the public official can prove that the speaker acted with either reckless disregard for the truth or knew it was false, it was an absolute lie. And the court said that because it recognized that even though false statements of fact don't have any value, if we allow false statements of fact to be punished, then that will chill the willingness of people to make statements that they think may be true, but they're not sure. And they will therefore be silenced in a way that would dampen in a serious way the robustness of free speech. Uh, and that became a landmark and critical decision. In the years since then, the court has recognized that there are certain types of false statements that can be subject to government uh, action, libel being one in the circumstances identified in the New York Times. Others would be perjury in a court of law. Another would be fraud, in which one defrauds another person by making false statements. Another would be false commercial advertising. Um, but the court has since taken the basic view that even false statements of fact uh, cannot be restricted um, unless there is, at the very least, a very substantial government justification, as in the defamation, the perjury, the fraud situations, and even then only if the person acted with reckless disregard or knowledge of falsehood. Now, the question then is, well, what about false statements in public discourse, right? What about lies in public discourse, right? People tell lies, and they influence others, 
and they have a serious impact potentially on, the, on, on how people vote and how they behave as political uh, actors. And the court up till now has taken the view that those lies are not actionable, consistent with the First Amendment. And it's done that for basically um, two reasons. Uh, one of them is the chilling effect problem. Um, if you know that you are going to be held or potentially be held liable for a statement you make in public discourse because some juror finds it to be false, uh, you'll be very careful about what you say. And the sacrifice of freedom from that, the court says, is to be taken very seriously. The other and even more compelling justification is in the realm of public discourse, the idea of allowing government officials to decide which false statements to prosecute and which not to prosecute puts in the hands of public officials an extraordinary power to manipulate public discourse. And imagine, for example, if the Trump administration had the authority to decide which false statements it would prosecute and which it would not. It's easy to see how that would completely distort the marketplace of ideas. And so for those reasons, the court has basically taken the view that the government is not allowed to restrict that sort of false speech. Um, now, one of the interesting questions we face going forward in our society is up until now, we've been able to rely upon uh, what Holmes called the marketplace of ideas as a way of hoping to, to sort out truth and falsehood. That basically when people tell lies in public discourse, even if there's no criminal prosecution for it, other people will correct it, they will say the truth, and individual citizens will be able to decide for themselves in a rational way what is true and what is false. In a world of social media, that now becomes much more problematic. We now have a world in which people are increasingly fragmenting, polarizing in their sources of information, and in which they only hear one side of the debate. And in that context, false statements can have an increasingly powerful effect, much beyond what ever existed before. And whether that opens the door to saying there may be circumstances in which false statements can be restricted um, poses a really dire problem for democracy. For on the one hand, ignoring the problem is a problem. On the other hand, addressing it by allowing the government to decide who to prosecute and not to prosecute is also a dire problem. So that's something we will have to face going forward. It sounds like you can dimly imagine a Supreme Court changing First Amendment law I think with they respect would be, to the way it protects. I think they would be loath to do, do that. I think the, the danger of allowing government the power to decide who to prosecute and not to prosecute is overwhelming. But at the same time, we face a real problem. How do we address this polarization in information so as to avoid the, the kind of fragmentation and, and ignorance that this invites? And the, the solution shouldn't be prosecution. It should be figuring out ways to make people have access to ideas and facts different from the ones they're now choosing to focus on. So the, the solution to, to lies in the public sphere um, is not going to come from law. You, don't, you hope it doesn't come from law. It's got to come from the, from the culture, from character, from something else. Right. It'll come partly from education. I think we need to educate people um, much more seriously about the dangers of uh, getting all of your information from highly polarized sources. Um, and it'll also come, I think, from uh, the media, <clears throat> from entities like, say, Facebook and others, uh, who may start um, developing mechanisms instead of sending people only things that reinforce what they already look at, instead beginning to send them sources of information that are different from the ones that they automatically look at. Bill Russ, I'm, I'm a big <coughs> as a historian, I'm a big believer in the passage of time. And though there's the common expression that Trump years are dog years, you know, going back to our prior presentation, you know, we're only some months into this administration. The disturbing aspect of this, one might say, is uh, so much material came out during the election campaign itself. I think the work done by the Washington Post and the New York Times, obviously appealing to a, to a liberal reading body, was pretty compelling work. And there was ample evidence of the difficulties the nation finds itself now that was already available. So it wasn't countervailing enough at that point in terms of electoral politics. But you know, it's only some months in. And it's, uh, it seems to me it's still a highly dynamic uh, situation and you know there is movement in the public opinion polls. I mean, I, I'm a net believer. I think even though Jefferson was a real Pollyanna and was terribly naive about a lot of things, but I, I think the Jeffersonian norm that we want to argue things out as much as we possibly can first without having strong government restraint. I think that's a powerful norm. And if we look 
around the world, the number of authoritarian regimes that are flourishing in other countries that are, are quite happy to start cracking down on freedom of speech, freedom of press in ways that would be wholly uh, unacceptable by American standards. I think we're better off sticking so far, at least, with the conventional wisdom, let the story play out, than to panic. You know, to, a libertarian, you know, a libertarian right. regime when it comes right. to right. when it comes to speech and and and, yeah. and writing, yeah. and also oh, religion, and, and, yeah. and religion. Yeah. Yeah. But we move from a world where um, most people used to get their information from mainstream, reasonably responsible, relatively moderate sources, um, where there was a fairness doctrine which required uh, radio and television stations to present both sides of all issues. If they allowed one candidate to appear, they had to allow the other candidate to appear. That's all gone. And the, the sources of information that we get now is completely different from what it was 30, 40 years ago. Is there an analog that you could uh, locate in American history when, when citizens got their news from oh, very God, restricted you know. sources and maybe uh, only there's a, selected? There's a great op-ed either in today's New York Times, tomorrow's New York Times, says historians don't believe in analogies and we don't make comparisons. We want to you know, take every case. Each comes. thing is but, its own you know, thing. But, right, but on the <laughs> other hand, you know, it's not unlike the 1790s, and it's not wholly unlike the 1850s. I mean, those were periods of deep political passion. You know, one leading to an election where, you know, half the population thought the, the union might well devolve, and the second one leading to an election where the union really did devolve. So, you know, taking the long view, as historians are by nature want to do, I'm still, you know, still going to cut us some slack. This may, it may not be quite, you know, the dramatic crisis, you know, it yet seems. So when it comes to uh, differentiating, finding our way in a world where, where, where there's truth and where there's lots of lies and, and lots of deception, um, you're both libertarians. You, you, you're believers in reason. You think it's up to citizens to, to sort this out as, as best they can manage through argument, through discussion, through reflection, and, and that the solution isn't going to come, you hope, from, from law and, and well, from Well, it can courts. come from education, and I think that's important. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to turn to our next, the next episode in this deep dive session. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jack. Spy who can spell uh, a true story of, of espionage that you can download to your Kindles after this session and read on your flights home. I hope um, you'll do that. And yes. you've also in, in a, it, it recently um, done a, a long piece for the National Geographic on, on lying the result of your own investigation into the, into the science of lying to, to, to better understand it. And, um, and, and let me say, I don't know myself, I've never looked into the science of lying, but if I were to guess, I, I suppose what I'd say is that most people aren't liars. Most people tell the truth most of the time, all the time. There are a few people, maybe bad apples, rotten apples, well, that, sir, is Oddly a lie. That, <laughs> that, that is a lie. If, that's if, not true. If everyone okay. was Tell told. us, then. What's because it turns out, and, and you, know, you were only slightly exaggerating when you said that I investigated the science of lying. I actually spoke to researchers who investigated the science of lying. Um, but but to, to, to simplify matters, yes, indeed, uh, it turns out that lying is a very common human trait. It is both universal. It is, it, is, uh, it is done frequently. Uh, people on average lie at least two to three times a day. Uh, most people lie. Most people There lie. are outliers, as in, <laughs> as in people who uh, both lie a lot more and egregiously than others, as well as people who are you know, just by default so honest as, as you said your wife is, uh, right? Well. <laughs> she may be here, and that's how I think of her. That's how I think. Of her. No, and, and it's and it's true. There are there are some people who maybe I'm going to actually, reevaluate after having. Well, there are some people who just who are truth tellers almost, you know, to a fault, uh, yeah. certainly. But the fact is that most of us lie, and we lie frequently. And what are we lying about every day? So two, two three, four, five times. Right. So our day to day lies are mostly sort of polite lies, the white lies that sort of lubricate social interactions. Um, you know, we, we lie when we say uh, to a friend that we're supposed to meet that, oh, I, I'm on my way when actually you're just exiting, uh, you know, your, your bathroom to get ready or something. Uh, so those, those lies are sort of harmless lies, but we, we tell them 
uh, because we don't want to hurt other people's feelings. But we flex the same muscle when we tell bigger lies. Uh, we tell lies like, oh, I'm, I'm sick today. I can't make it into work, when actually you know, your kid needs to go somewhere you know, to pick up shoes or something for a, a baseball game. And so you, you want to not go into work that day. Uh, what do you so, mean we flex the same muscle? Well, we flex the same muscle in the sense that we, we have the capacity for bending the truth in ways big and small. Uh, and it's not just the polite lies that we're telling. We're also telling, less frequently, the bigger lies. Uh, and there's a continuum of lying. And we know who stands at, at sort of the, the far end of that continuum. <laughs> so we, we, we all lie. I mean, this does strike me as a surprise. I'm surprised by this. But anyway, we all lie. We all lie a lot. Um, when do we learn to lie? Is it college or business school? <laughs> <laughs> we, we learn to lie as, as kids. We learn to lie, you know, by the age of four or five. We've already started telling little lies. And mm -hmm. we do this, I think somebody said earlier in one of the panels, uh, I think you mentioned it when you were introducing the panels, that politicians lie in order to create an alternate reality so that they can enjoy power. Well, kids sort of do the same thing because there's a huge power imbalance between children and adults. Uh, and so by the age of four and five, kids have started to tell little lies, not very sophisticated ones, but as their language develops and as what's known as theory of mind develops, which is their ability to read the thoughts and intentions of others, they start getting more sophisticated in their lying. Uh, and by the time they're teenagers, they actually hit the roof. You know, as teenagers, uh, people lie a lot more than they will once they've actually grown into full adults. Hmm. Uh, so how should we, should we feel good then when our children lie? Is that the? Well, in one sense, yes, because when children start to lie, uh, you know that they're developing theory of mind, which is a very important developmental milestone. Uh, and so children do sort of rehearse, they practice, you know. They, theory of mind, meaning? Theory of mind, meaning? They can imagine, they can imagine the way other people are thinking. That's and so right. So they try to reshape other people's thoughts by putting a distortion out there. Through that's speech. exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So this imaginative participation in the thoughts of another. If I can't imagine the way you're thinking, then I'm not going to be able to know right. how to lie to you effectively. So there's a. That's right. I mean, think about the power of a lie just in general. Uh, you know, it, it's like you might have to physically overwhelm somebody, uh, you know, beat them to the ground to, to steal something from them. But if you can make them believe something that is not true, that is convenient to you, then you might be able to extract certain, a certain power from that situation that you otherwise wouldn't. So children, it turns out, learn the power of lies very early. We can, we, it, lying allows us to have our way with, with much less violence than we might otherwise need to undertake. Indeed. Um, I mean, I guess I'm feeling better <laughs> <laughs> about this. Do, does this mean, if we're natural liars, does that also mean that we are naturally um, skeptical and, and distrustful and, uh, of other people? That, that would seem to go along with it. If, if we all learn to lie at age five or six, then we must all learn to not believe each other by age seven or eight. Well, so that is the paradox of human nature, that we, we lie, we all lie, but we are also uh, inherently very trusting of information that we get. Um, and there's a reason for that, because we're a cooperative species. Uh, society would just collapse if, you know, if I were here on stage, and, and if you just couldn't believe a word I said, I, I hope you do. So we're naturally credulous. We naturally believe each other. Yes, we do. Because, even though we're also... Because we need to in order to function. We all have a propensity to lie. That's right. Maybe as much as every day. And in fact, because we're so trusting uh, of others, it also makes us very poor as lie detectors. Huh. And so especially teenagers, teenage kids can lie to their parents very, very effectively. And parents are completely bamboozled, even though the parents, you know, have theory of mind, they know that they did the same thing when they were teenagers. <laughs> but, but they're, you know, it, 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 it is the result of 
uh, our trusting nature that people get away with so many lies, even in the political discourse. It's fascinating. I mean, it, listening to you makes me think that, on one hand, I guess the world can't really accept truth. It, it, to, to, be, to be a complete truth teller is kind of brutal and maybe inconsiderate. And, and so it's like social life requires a lot of lying, but also a lot of believing. It's like lying makes the world turn on your account. And well, certainly, you know, social interactions require lying, but it's funny that we don't lie much more than we do. I mean, that really, you know, there's a researcher named Dan Ariely. He's a professor at Duke University, and when I talked to him, uh, he wasn't surprised by the fact that lying is so frequent because that research is somewhat old. He was interested in the fact that when we do have the option to lie and cheat and be dishonest, most of us actually don't exercise that option as much as we could. You know, we don't walk around our workplaces stealing pencils and staplers every day. I mean, we might do it once, once in a, a while. Month. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, so there's, there are these limits that are placed on dishonesty. This kind of exquisite equilibrium where we lie, we all lie, but just a little bit. Just We're a little bit. Right it's amount, almost like, much. you know, the fine engineering of lying has been worked out by social consensus, it's just like driving 10 miles over the speed limit. Can we maintain that sort of um, traditional, wholesome, common sense view that lying is bad after digesting this research? Right. I mean, if, if, if I, I think if I heard my son or daughter lie, I'd say, don't, that's bad, you shouldn't. Um, and secretly can I maintain be happy, that? yes. Yeah, well, uh, I, I think that lying is bad, and I think that the evidence that we're seeing from you know, the era that we're living in right now, which other panelists have, have talked about, certainly reinforces my, uh, my belief that lying is bad. I mean, just the fact that lying is a part of human nature doesn't give us license to now be lying more and more frequently and tell bigger lies. Um, we're, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting what social media and President Trump have done sort of in tandem to our sense of reality. And again, I'm just echoing what you alluded to uh, when, when we began. You know, President Trump's lies, such as the one that, you know, I think you quoted maybe one or two, about the illegal voters. Um, I mean, there's sort of a Hurricane Katrina, you know, in, in sort of the lying landscape. And they're literally, they have shaken, you know, the, the boundaries of how much lying is acceptable. And then you've got social media, which is a new technology, relatively new, where all you need is an army of believers to peddle the same lies uh, until it just gets accepted as the truth by enough people so that it can live on forever. And I don't think we've found a solution. I mean, I, you know, I'd love to share the optimism of uh, the legal scholar who spoke before me. I, I'm blanking on the name, I'm sorry. Uh, but, it, but I do think that we're in an unprecedented kind of, a, mm. of an era where unless we reflect on what is going on and really become more vigilant about what kinds of information to believe, and then more importantly, what kinds of information to then pass on to our social networks. Uh, you know, we won't be able to solve this problem. In fact, I spoke to a number of communications researchers who are trying to work on this problem of how do you debunk a lie on social media. What is really effective? Do you simply put out the actual facts of the case and keep blasting it and out? That, that doesn't regularly? work. It doesn't. Yeah. I mean, I think somebody before me mentioned that despite all of the stories, all of the great journalism that was done by the New York Times and the Washington Post, it didn't really sway the electorate to the extent that people thought it might. Uh, and, and the reason is that none of those actual facts were taken into consideration when 
people took stock of what they believed to be the reality of the situation. Maybe we're, we're moving into a world where there's, um, where there's not so much truth and, and lies, but where everything is opinion, and where every opinion is as good as every other. Um, and and let, me, let me just invite anyone from the audience who might have a question about the science of lying, or you digit, um, to raise your hand. Uh, we have a couple microphones around, and, and if anyone has a question, be happy to. Could we ask it. a question over here? I, don't. I see right. Okay, go ahead. Over here. Um, and we, I see you over there too. Yep. Thank you. Yes. yes. Um, it's very interesting. Um, when do you advise? Let's assume a teenager, and then you're growing up, and you learn to you, you learn to lie. Then you get you're so good at it that you actually believe it's true. How would you go about talking to them? What's your recommendation? Well, my kids are still 7 and 12, so check back with me in, in, in a couple of years. But, uh, but I, you know, I, I was on a radio show recently, and somebody brought up a similar question, where they said um, that they had, th this was a person who had kind of become a habitual liar. And he said that he had developed this habit since childhood, since the, since the age of 11 or 12, uh, because he was gay and he, would, he was not able to disclose to his family and his friends that he was gay. And so starting with that secret, he just became kind of his tendencies for lying just increased from that point on. And so he was asking me if there was any advice for a person like him to kind of undo this lying habit. Um, and I, I didn't have a good answer, um, which is sort of my long way of saying that I don't have a good answer to your question. <laughs> yes. Uh, they got the microphone on. OK. Uh, uh, the question is, I've got is in between the two. So between truth and lying is this big gray area and uh, commonly referred to as spin in politics. Uh, uh, listening to politicians of both parties, some individuals, every word that comes out of their mouth is spin. Every word. So is that lying? I, I, let me just step in. I know I, I, that's what makes it sometimes hard. And I teach politics, and I, I, I feel like I should watch more of you know, debates and things. And often I just can't bear to watch because that, that quality of spin just turns me off. And, and I think that's what Professor Frankfurt was trying to define in that elegant little essay on bullshit. Um, there's something quaint about both truth telling and lying. Both liars and truth tellers believe in the truth. Liars want you to believe them. They want you to think that what they're saying is true. So they, they like the truth too. You might say. Well, but I think I think spin BS is, is about making, yeah. you know, us all indifferent to what's true and what's false. Right. Throwing up our hands as if we just can't, you know, see through the fog. Well, I think spin is, you know, is a very clever form of lying, and it's been accepted in the culture of marketing and advertising and political communication. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it's really, it really falls on that continuum between outright falsehoods and you know, the complete and the whole truth. Uh, but spin comes in different forms. You know, when people say, look, the evidence is still not out there. You still don't know. I mean, that's one kind of spin. You know, that was a kind of spin that the tobacco industry used for some time when they said, well, we don't really know, mm. which was their, you know, their form of, they couldn't just say there's no link between lung cancer and tobacco. Uh, they had to say something like, well, we don't know yet. We just bought them time. And I see something similar going on with climate change right now where you know, the deniers are trying to buy more and more time by saying, human activity isn't that important. And that's another form of spin. Uh, but I think, I think somebody here already stressed you know, the idea of education. But along with education, I would stress the idea of critical thinking, where, you know, where we develop the, the faculty to really un, undo the spin that we're receiving mm -hmm. with our information. Critical thinking. That's the perfect note to end this, this, this episode with. Thank you. We have a faith in, um, in this whole Oliver Wendell Holmes idea of the marketplace of ideas, the idea that the way you can get at truth is encouraging people of opposite views to yell at each other. 
And that is not an obvious, and nor has it always been the way to get at truth. And I think that one of the origins is the law. And so I wanted Neil to explain to us um, where that comes from. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you. It, you know, it started, we had all sorts of different mechanisms for uh, obtaining truth. So in the Middle e medieval ages, we used trial by ordeal, which is literally forcing people who we thought were guilty. You have to carry a burning hot iron bar and we would decide whether or not you're able to hold it long enough or pluck a stone from boiling a pot of boiling water and see how long you'd hold it. And that would be the way in which we'd determine truth or not. Um, obviously, that didn't work so well. And so from the 14th to 18th centuries, we started to move toward an adversarial system. And that's now really the American legal system. And if I could, you know, maybe the best example of it is my very first Supreme Court case. Um, I was defending bin Laden's driver. And you could imagine lots of emails, lots of people saying, he's guilty, he's guilty, he should get the death penalty. And I took the case, brought it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and 11 years ago tomorrow won the case. And I remember listening to the opinion being handed down by the justices, by Justice Stevens, he's reading this opinion, it's 174 pages long, and he's summarizing in like a half hour and why you know, he, Mr. Hamdan, this driver, would get all sorts of rights that President Bush wasn't giving him and so on. And then you know, the dissents were being written, read. The people who disagreed, Justice Scalia saying, Americans will die. Justice Thomas saying, I believe so strongly, I'm gonna read my dissent for the first time in my 15 years on the bench. He actually, that was itself not true. Uh, he had forgotten he had read the dissent before. Um, but I went out on the courtroom st courthouse steps and there's like 500 cameras and everyone's trying to ask, what does the decision mean? Well, it's 174 pages long, so I hadn't read it yet. But here's what I think it meant and I think it demonstrates the genesis of the adversarial system. I said, look, here's what happened on this day. You had in America the lowest of the low. This guy's accused of being the worst of the worst. Bin Laden's you know, accomplice. And he brings a case, not just against anyone, but the highest man in the land, the President of the United States. And he brings it not in some rinky-dink traffic court, but in the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court of the United States, and he wins. That's something great about America. In many other countries, this driver would have been shot for bringing his case. More to the point to me, his lawyer would have been shot. But <laughs> that's what makes America special, the system of truth-seeking. And that's something we see day in, day out, I mean, just to make, bring it up to date, you know, two hours ago, the Supreme Court said that they were going to uh, hear this travel ban case, my, my case, I'm representing Hawaii on that, in the fall. Again, we, our system doesn't just say, oh, President Trump, you say this is important for national security and you win. No, we test that out in the crucible of ideas with advocates on both sides coming in and trying to defend their position and the idea is both sides are gonna have biases and that's how we ultimately get a truth because hopefully those biases will cancel each other out. Well, actually, that, I mean, that leads me to something that's a little perverse about our adversarial system, um, which is that it requires, uh, it's not only gives an incentive, but in fact, it makes it a duty for advocates to um, push for the winning of their side rather than the truth. Um, it promotes untruth in the service of truth. So I was wondering if you could talk about that and also maybe compare it to a system which we're less familiar with, the continental uh, legal system, which is not adversarial in right. the same way. <clears throat> so you're absolutely right. The adversarial system has as its genesis the idea that you're supposed to defend it basically almost all costs. So this is what like one of the most prominent English lawyers said uh, last century, Henry Brogan, who was defending Queen Caroline. Quote, an advocate knows but one person in all the world, and that person is his client. To save that client by all means and expedience is his first and only duty. In performing this duty, he must, did not disre he must disregard the alarm, the torments, the destruction which he may bring upon others. So the adversarial system depends on essentially you coming in, you know, guns blazing. And if you have, for example, the European system, which has really a judge kind of as an inquisitor asking questions and trying to formally get at the truth in a way that doesn't have advocates on both sides, that's a different way of looking at it. I think our founders thought we don't trust any judge enough to be neutral because that judge is also going to have biases, that so-called inquisitor. But the European system, that is, you're absolutely right, the way it operates. Um, you know, I think there's pros and cons. The biggest con to our system is that 
the adversarial system really does depend on competent counsel that you can afford in, in a world in which approximately 80% of felons don't actually have money for representation and have to use public defenders who are often financially strapped with low funding, you know, you don't often get a truth and that's why you have plea bargains and all the kinds of things that we see happening. Um, so I wanted to turn to you, Drew, because um, one thing I'm sure we've all read about uh, recently is the replication crisis in the sciences, particularly not so much your area, but psychology and clinical medicine, uh, the discovery that many, many um, often longstanding uh, findings could not be replicated, did not hold up. And so I was wondering if you felt that there was a lack of adversarial culture in the publishing of scientific journals. Should they have some kind of prosecutorial function? Should there be more of an incentive or a duty to try to undermine findings that have been published? Sure, but is that practical and does it scale? Uh, so it's, it's a nice to think about, but I wouldn't know how to implement. I think part of science also depends on a type of cooperation and sharing. And, and maybe I could offer that simply uh, with an example. So how could we agree on the width of this room? How could you have confidence in my assertion that maybe it's 30 or 40 meters <coughs> across? So science depends on observation initially. And um, you know, in the case of length, that's because in 1875, 17 nations came together in Paris and agreed on the meter and signed a treaty that said, we're gonna keep track of length through this agreement, and so I can observe something and then represent it and trace it back to a reference object that we all agree. And um, you know, if we can't agree on what we're observing, then it's gonna be very hard to be an adversary, to try and replicate something, to communicate what I observe such that you could attempt to repeat it or undermine it through uh, 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 an adversarial position. So on the one hand, we do have scientific peer review that comes at the end of the process, but science as a process begins with ideas, right? And we heard this morning, you know, there's a lot of um, idiosyncratic individuals coming from many different backgrounds who are remixing observations, ideas, and concepts, and then something beautiful is discovered or invented from that. Um, maybe you weave more adversarial competition up front, or it's hard to say. But I, I think the important thing I could represent so far as science goes is it starts with observation. If we can't make and share observations and not have faith in observations, but confidence in the sharing of observations, then we're done for. Yeah. And, and that, that's just an important thing to, to open with, I think. Well, we talked a little bit before about, about open journals, which is a yeah. new model for scientific publication that rather than having peer review, anonymous peer review, um, it is, it is uh, a much more open system. What do you think? I mean, you said that you thought that was a great thing. Why? Yeah, op Why? openness in the research process with journals again being the back end, and then you have preprint servers where things are published prior to peer review. You can, you know, if I had a manuscript, I could put it online and everybody in the world could read it in a, about 60 minutes. It'd be open. Uh, that's great. But you can go even further. You could share your ideas openly on a wiki and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this experiment. Uh, what do other people think? And you could have constructive adversaries or competition right from the very beginning of ideation. The entire rambling research cycle could be open. Um, that's both good and bad. Some of my best friends, professors at Caltech, will run their research meetings in secret. Mm -hmm. And that's special for them because they need that privacy to feel that they're really concentrating their energy and keeping people from stealing ideas. You know, seems kind of strange, but it's good to have options, I would say. And openness in biology in particular has been a big boon uh, over the last couple years. Um, Yvonne, I wanted to ask you about, obviously, um, truth, truth checking in the media. Um, obviously, in, in faster moving forms of media, like um, blog posts and newspapers, there isn't always time for fact checking. But in magazines like The Atlantic um, and The New Yorker, my magazine, we do have an extensive process. And I know that people don't always understand how that works. And I was wondering if you could explain um, how you, how, what counts for you as evidence, how, what sources do you trust? Uh, in particular books, you know, books are not usually themselves checked, so do you trust them? Which books? How do you know what to believe? Um, you keep digging, I think is how you know whether to believe, what to believe. And I do think that, you know, everyone wants a, um, wants a magic list. You want a list of, oh, here are the go-to sources and I'm only going to trust what the New York Times says, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, you know, whatever. Obviously to go to a place that you know has a system in place 
The New Yorker, any paper of record certainly has a system, an editorial system, whereby managing editors and editors are constantly talking to their authors and saying, how do you know this? How do you know this? Who's this anonymous source? Those are, you know, again, the papers of record, the ones that we should always go to and think about. But what I find is that the most important thing is that you have to always try to find out who is the expert in this. I'm not an expert in anything besides checking at this point. And so I'd need to call Glenn. I'd need to sort of go to the person who understands the subject. I'd need to talk to the lawyer. I'd need to talk to the person. And sometimes that person is not the person who wrote the article for New Yorker. Sometimes it is the person who is on the ground and who knows about the terrible thing that happened in Bangladesh that day and they've been, they know all the people and they've been studying it for a while. So it's to go, sort of, it's the bullseye effect that you go to the center of where the person who knows that information and is the expert in it. But it's also in the triangulation of data. Like for anything that we're trying to understand, you go to multiple sources so that if, you know, obviously every place has its own bias, so then you need to go to one side and then to the other side and then to read a few more, to talk to a few experts, to talk to a few scientists, to talk to a few doctors, to understand where the truth is. And oftentimes the truth is somewhere in the middle there. So there is that, it's the mechanism. And a checker is only basically acting in part as a, um, you know, sort of a guardian angel behind an author to sort of say, so where did you get this? And how do you know it's true? And do, do you really think, I know you're sort of, you know, I know your husband is in this field, so let's talk about that. That's sort of an issue that, you know, you must have your own bias that you bring to this. So again, it's in the conversation. We're, we're gatekeepers of a sort. We try to find the correct information by going to multiple sources. We try to have a conversation with the author to know what they're basing it on. We go to the books and we read the books and we bring up other questions that are imperative to it. Um, the, and you talk about sort of books. Obviously, most books are not fact-checked. Nothing on the web, for all intents and purposes, is fact-checked, except if it's coming from a really strong, reliable source. But for books, you look at who the author is. Are they an expert in their field? Do they have pages and pages of footnotes? Let's look to the footnote. Let's go to the original source in order to understand if that really is accurate or not. Again, it's, it's, there's no magic pill. It's time and work. Yeah, so in effect, the, the model there is, is replication rather than adversarial. I mean, it's not an adversarial process. It it's, be. it's trying to replicate the process of reporting that led the writer um, to that position. Um, I wanted to ask you for a second about, um, about lies. I mean, most, um, most falsehoods in journalism are a result of rushing or, or incompetence or just, uh, just uh, their mistakes. But sometimes you get outright frauds um, that are often quite famous, you know, the Stephen Glasses or the Jason Blairs. Um, have you, as a fact checker, developed a sort of sense when you're reading something, a smell for bullshit? Are there indications <laughs> that make you suspicious that you can pass on to us? <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, I mean the answer is sure that it, it it actually that you do sort of tell for the the Stephen Glasses and the Jason Blairs. I mean, if someone is truly certifiable and mentally ill, that they are so desperate that they need to make fake voicemails and fake documentation. That's you know, you're, it's very hard to combat that, and I you know sort of do not sleep well at night because of my constant fear of that. But what I sort of find again and again is that. And I'm, I don't know, you know, sort of what the checker did or what his checkers did in, in that case. But the reality is, is that if a checker picks up the phone and tries to call that person, who tries to sort of reach that company, tries to get a comment, tries to sort of really follow the trail, you know, that, that would have sort of exploded that a lot earlier than it did. And I think sort of we're all reliant on... Um, the web now. We forget that phone that we have now in our pocket. We, you know, take emails. And rather than sort of taking an email, you should basically be calling the same people that the journalist spoke to, making sure that every conversation, you know, sort of is replicated. And I think if that's done, then that makes all the difference. It's, it's the failure of the one source stories, the Rolling Stone, you know, terrible case about the UVA rape story. Again, it's a one source story that was not defined as a one source story if the, if the checker or if, if whoever had called any number of the main characters of that story besides the one woman who was 
you know, claiming that she had been raped. That story would have been blown up very early on. So that is the sniff test. If it's a one, if you can't speak to the people that the journalist spoke to, then you sort of go to the editor and say, "There's a problem here," and you keep digging with that. But I, I was I was preparing for this, um, talking to um, a uh, wonderful writer at the New Yorker who who was a fact checker, um, Rafi Kajadorian, and um, he. He felt that um, it was a very important aspect of truth-seeking um, to, to have people in a room together um, talking to each other or on the phone, um, that, that, that not just relying on documents, on, on pieces of paper. And um, I wanted to ask Neil about this because obviously cases are tried in person um, and that means that there are some possibly biasing effects of the personal qualities of the people involved, the attorneys, the defendants, the witnesses, um, do they seem truthful? Obviously that's um, not always tied to them actually being truthful. And so I was wondering um, what difference you thought it would make if cases were not tried in person, in a room with people together, but rather were uh, uh, tried by documents. Right, so the European system does use documents a lot more and a lot less live testimony. And I do think it doesn't work as well. I mean, the fact is very similar to what Yvonne's saying is, you know, it's easy to sculpt a lie and on paper and to defend it on paper, but it's the dynamic process of interaction between people and seeing how they react and seeing how a story coheres. And, you know, it's harder to lie in person than it is on a piece of paper. Um, all of that together is what underlies our system. And to be sure, there's distorting effects when you have personalities physically involved. I mean, actually, my the first article I read of yours maybe 15 years ago was about a divorce attorney who had come in and you know call the person by the wrong name just to try and get them flustered or make a comment about their appearance or something like that. So there's all sorts of shenanigans that are at play in in-person dynamics. But at the end of the day, my sense is it's a lot better to have the in-person truth-seeking function than some cold paper record. Mm -hmm. um, Drew, when you and I were, were discussing this beforehand, you said that um, uh, and I, I think we would all agree that it's crucially important um, to what we believe, uh, what we want to believe. And I was wondering how that affects your work as a scientist. Yeah, I mean, if we can't agree on what we observe and what we can do, then it becomes very hard to uh, articulate a common telos, what we would imagine is possible, what we would aspire to make true. And so if there's an undermining of observation or undermining of trust and communication about what we observe, then it puts somebody in my position of doubting what other people are reporting, but also grossly inhibiting what I dream. And um, it's an interesting time from the world of science and engineering where you can see advances in information and in biology and other forms of technology. And if you do the back of the envelope analyses, it looks like the numbers add up such that we could provision for 10 billion people without trashing the planet. That's what the physics says if you believe the facts and the observations. But if I can't, for example, read the report from a company that makes photovoltaic solar and says this is how much energy we use to make these panels and this is how much uh, we shipped in terms of panels and this is how much energy is produced off those panels, then I can't come to a net assessment of our energy budget and so I can't make an argument for a policymaker or anybody about what we might as a civilization aspire to. And that undermines my capacity to both dream about what I would want to discover or what technologies I'd want to invent or what world I'd want to be part of. And um, you know, I, I guess I could just say plainly, it's baffling to me, it's amazingly frustrating to me. Uh, I would agree with Russ's comments that there's an undermining uh, of political power that's at play uh, debasing certain factions within our society relative to others. And, you know, a lot of what I encounter out in California is we're basically walling off certain sectors of our society and we're trying to compartmentalize Washington so we can just keep moving out. And that's not a good outcome or healthy. And, and so, in any case, you know, I think there's a relationship between truth and telos is what I'm trying to say in the abstract. What do we aspire to make true? Is there a common victory? Uh, uh, that's associated with our values and what we could realize. And based on what I can observe, it looks like it's all right in front of us and we can really go pull it off. Yet ironically, at the very moment where that seems like it's possible, the whole questioning of, you know, can we communicate with each other, like facts, uh, is really, really stressful. 
yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it seems like there is a, uh, a market failure in this marketplace of ideas. It doesn't function the way we uh, want it to or imagine it does. And um, you mentioned you thought that uh, in scientific methods and techniques, there might be the beginnings of an answer um, for how we could try. It's obviously very difficult to move beyond what we believe, um, how we could try to do that. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, with the meter example, we inherit from the 19th century uh, an agreement. We agree to measurements of length and observations of length. Um, that way of thinking, the science of metrology, has kept pace a little bit. So for example, if you're getting your genome sequence, how would you know whether or not the machine that read out your genome gave you the right sequence? And it turns out there's a product from NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, called the Genome in a Bottle. And it is the reference genome, just like the meter stick, but for a sequence of DNA, so that anybody running a sequencing platform can compare your read to the standard genome, and now you have a sense of confidence in the information they're telling you, and that's relevant for clinical decisions and so, so forth. But much beyond that, once you get into the frontier, where the reference standards don't exist, the metrology, the science of measurement and observation haven't matured yet, then what? And there are some tools from science that I think are relevant. Uh, it's called control experiments. You know, I'm doing an experiment. I have no idea how it's going to behave. I want to bookend that with an experiment where nothing should happen and an experiment where a lot of things should happen. And my actual experiment that I care about is going to be in between. So I'll give you a simple example. Let's say I wanted to take a gene that makes a green protein and put it in an organism so the organism's green. That's the thing I hope to happen, but I don't know how green the organism's gonna be, and I'm not sure how good my detectors are at measuring green. So if that's my main experiment, and I don't know exactly how it's gonna play out, and there's no meter stick for green genes yet, um, I'm gonna run two other experiments in parallel. I'm gonna run an experiment where I add nothing, and so that organism should not change color. And then I'm gonna have an organism, I hope, from somewhere, somebody else made, that's already really green. And by running these two negative and positive experiments in parallel, I can bookend and calibrate my uncontrolled result and then try and make sense of it. So if you're operating in a context where nobody can agree on what the benchmark is, one tool from science is to articulate the ends of the spectrum, where everything is happening or nothing is happening, and then you can get a sense of where things are in between. And that's how we operate on the frontier in science when we haven't figured out how to agree on how to observe things or make measurements. And it takes work. It takes additional experimentation. It costs more. If you're an individual person in a healthcare setting, you know, you don't have those positive and negative controls. You're really oftentimes shooting in the dark, right? right? So it doesn't always work. But it's a, it's a powerful tool that we try and bring to the first year undergraduates. How do you set up controls? Well, I guess I wonder if, if, if um uh, both of you, Yvonne and, and Neil, can uh, address that fact that we seem to have lost our common systems of measurement. Um, and is there any lesson from checking or from the law that we can get back to a working adversarial system of truth uh, that we had more of, I think we would agree, uh, some decades ago? <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> I us. really hope so. Um, you know, so many other presenters have sort of said the same thing, education, um, talking about it. I mean, even it, it's interesting to sort of hear, you know, sort of we're ostensibly in, in a very similar field. We're both looking for the truth. We're both looking for answers and things. And it, as you say, it's controlled. It's looking at each level and each degree. And, and I always find that mm, typically things really fall down to being in the middle. And I think it, it's that necessity for more communication, for more understanding that the further we divide ourselves by just sticking to one perspective or one viewpoint, the further we will understand anything that there is to know. So that it is, it does take in order for us to sort of grow and to be truly informed for us to be open to different ideas and then somehow sort of find forge a path down the middle. And it's truly about communication. It's truly about, you know, sort of reaching out to people who you might be on the opposite side of an argument with to try to find the path forward. 
Mm -hmm. Maybe I could riff off that by talking a little bit about our American design because I think our founders in the New Deal really laced something very similar in, which was we don't really ha know what truth is. We disagree in our far-flung democracy about what that actually means. And so what are we going to do? We're going to separate the branches and have separation of powers and federalism because we don't want any one person to have a monopoly on power and to, a monopoly on what truth is. And the New Deal did that, you know, because obviously our founders didn't anticipate political parties. It did it in a way within the executive branch itself. So if you think about the creation of the State Department and the Defense Department or the EPA and Commerce, normally, maybe not right now, they do check one another. You know, they're, they're, they're seen as kind of clashing um, and, you know, one standing for the environment and one standing for business interests, at least in an ideal world. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, that's the genesis of where the American system, I think, has gone, which is to say, okay, we're not going to always agree on truth, but darn it, we're going to get everyone in a room or even in written memos sometimes, and they're going to debate and disagree and then ultimately be teed up for a decision. And do you, do you strongly believe that this is the best model for truth seeking? I mean, this is what we find, where we find ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I think it's better than anything else that's come along. Obviously, right now poses some challenges because you have both the disintegration of sep classical Madisonian separation of powers because of one party government in terms of all the political branches, but you also have really a kind of withering of the bureaucracy and assault on these kinds of checks and balances within the executive branch. To give you one example I've written a lot about, the State Department since, the, since Vietnam has had something called the dissent channel. And you actually get a prize for winning, for, for, for using this in the most effective way. A foreign service officer who says, I really disagree with something the State Department is doing. And that's a kind of, it goes to like the elite policy planning office. It's a big deal. Um, but we're seeing a lot of that kind of the use of those channels really being attacked right now. And, you know, so I'm not a fan of how it's operating right now, but if you think, as Jack was talking about, if you think more historically, uh, I do think the American system has worked quite well. I'll just ask, end with one question. Um, anyone can answer who, who has an idea about this. Um, uh, since uh, Moneyball and since Daniel Kahneman, we've, we've been encouraged to uh, suppress our intuitions about the truth in favor of trusting data. And I was wondering if you thought that was a solution or if it's possible to go too far in that direction. Um, obviously, polls, uh, we, many people trusted polls in the last election, and th that particular data uh, did not uh, seem to be as correct as we thought. So do you think that's a solution or a false solution? I don't think it's an either or situation. Like one extreme or another is almost never the right strategy. But I will note the poem from Borges on exactitude in science or del rigor la ciencia, where he talks about map making. And uh, the map makers are making a map of the province that's as big as a city and then a map of the nation that's as big as the province. And then they become unsatisfied and they make eventually a map of the country that's as big as the country itself and corresponds with the country point for point. And um, you know, it's like a big data map. And it's just not useful. And subsequent generations <laughs> abandon it. And, and so the, the mix here is how do you combine data with abstractions, data with models, data with meaning? Right. And um, if we get better at that, you know, which I think Moneyball, you know, there, there's a model for baseball, right? It's not just the statistics about how the players are performing. Right. Um, in any case. Thank you very much. Oh. I, I was just going to say, there are some places in our society in which big data will just never work because the cost of error and getting it wrong is too high. Just take guilt and innocence in a criminal trial. I don't think anyone in this room could ever imagine we could say, oh, well, you fit the profile of someone who'd be guilty according to big data, therefore we're sending you to prison. So sometimes the error costs are too high.